Today, uh, what I want to do um, is I want to sort of, if I can, for just a minute, I want to share uh, a quick story from my own life um, to help us kind of lead into this. So we're going to be in John chapter 14. If you, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Um, we'll be in John 14, 1 through 7. But before we get into that, um, I, I just want to share again a personal story. See, we all have moments in our life where we experience um, uh, kind of a moment that changes our life forever. We've all had these. Um, some of those moments in life are extremely obvious. When you, when you married that person, it changed your life forever. Um, you might even track that back a little further to when you met that person and how it ultimately led to your marriage and changed your life forever. The birth of a child changes your life. I mean, it really does. There's a Moments that you look back on in your life and you go, man, my life changed. Uh, a lot of people make sort of life changes when their children are born. Graduation, high school graduation, college graduation, those are all uh, pivotal points in the life of people. And then maybe it was a job promotion for you or a job that you got, the job that you applied for. And that job that you applied for caused you to have to move or relocate or maybe it just put you in a better financial position. And because of all of those things, that job becomes uh, one of those moments for you that were life changing and changed the course of your life. And some of those moments are really less obvious, right? I mean, there are moments in life that when we look back on them, we see them now as life changing moments. But when we went through them, we didn't really understand the significance of those moments when we walk through those things. They can appear to be very random. They can appear to be very, I mean, they're definitely unforeseen and, and maybe at the time insignificant. And certainly we would say that they were probably unplanned. But when we look at it all in retrospect, they become forks in the road, pivot points in the history of our life that we look back on and we go, everything changed right here. And, and again, these weren't big moments that we saw coming. They just, we went through them, we experienced them, then we look back and once we look back, we see that life changed right there. In order to set up today's message, I want to share one of those moments in my own life and hope that maybe for, maybe for all of us today, it would be an opportunity for us to consider maybe the moments in life that we're going through right now to consider possibly um, maybe God wants to speak something to you today that, that, that might, help it, might, might help awaken some things in you about your own spiritual walk. See, in 2001, I was asked to attend an evangelism conference. This is pre-ministry days. Uh, my pastor at the time said, hey, I would love for you to take a couple of days off. Go with me to Ocala, Florida. And we're gonna, there's going to be an evangelism conference down there. And I just would love for you to attend. And, these evangelism conferences, what they do is they set them up and they invite all these speakers in. And these guys are just really, really good at what they do. And most evangelism conferences are to, you know, they get these guys up on stage and they just get you really excited about going out and sharing the gospel. And, and uh, I agreed. I said, hey, I would love to do that. I would love to go. Um, he asked me to go with him because, honestly, he had been investing in me. He saw some potential in me. He had allowed me to speak in church a couple of times. Um, and, and so he said, hey, I just would love for you to go and experience this with me. So when we get to the evangelism conference, um, little did I know that when my pastor asked me to take a couple days off and attend this thing, that this would be a moment of movement for me in my life, okay? And what happened was, uh, there, was a, there was a man there that, uh, that spoke, and because of that message, um, here, because of that message, I'm standing here on this platform 20 years later. And see, when I agreed to go to the conference with him, I just thought, hey, it's just a conference. We're going to go. It'll be a couple days off from work. I'll get to hear some good preaching. It'll be a time of encouragement. I'll get to hang out with my pastor. It'll be like, great. Little did I know that that conference would be the reason that would put me into a place where I would be preaching to a bunch of Georgia Bulldogs. <laughs> Congratulations on your win. Yes. Thankfully, the Braves helped me out last night. Ended my day better. It was all good. But little did I know in that moment when he asked me to attend that conference with him that I would, that I would be here. And let me just say this. 
This all happened because the message, there was one particular message that, you know, again, they, they cycle speakers through, and it was on day two. There was a guy, he came up, never heard of him before. It wasn't like some guy that was a big name speaker in the Christian world. Just a guy, he comes up, and it, it just, the whole thing caught me off guard. And that's just sort of how God, God works. And it wasn't like an overly convicting message. Like, he wasn't one of these guys that got up there, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been underneath the preaching of a preacher who just, man, when like the veins start popping out in their neck and the vein starts popping out in their forehead and you're thinking, all right, we, we need the defibrillator ready because he might just cash it in right here, but he's preaching his heart out. And, it, and it's one of those where like, man, he just convicts the mess out of you. It wasn't one of those messages. It wasn't like he got up there and said, hey, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need you. And no, it wasn't one of those. It wasn't even a, a passionately communicated message that, might, that you might expect in an evangelism event where it's just one of those where, man, they give all these really cool stories and they pull at your heartstrings and you're like, man, I'm in. I don't even know what you're asking me to do, but I'll do it. It wasn't even one of those. No, this message was by a guy named Dr. Frank Harbour. Dr. Frank Harbour brought that day an, an apologetical message. And I don't mean apologetical in the sense that you think apologetical, like, hey, I apologize for what the church has done, or I apologize that preaching and teaching hasn't, whatever. It wasn't like an apology. It was apologetical in this sense of the word. Apologetics and theology is defined this way. It is the intellectual defense of the truth of the Christian religion. And it flows out of a passage of scripture found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And here's what 1 Peter 3, 15 says. It's not gonna be on the screen. I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy. And listen to this. Here's, here's where it's at. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And so he preaches, he builds the whole thing off of that. And it's like, huh. And here's what he does in that moment. Christian apologists, what they do is they argue for the defense of the gospel. They give us um, these, these historical proofs that really just, it's, it's not the foundation of our faith, but boy, it really solidifies our faith. And that day, I, I, you know, as I walked in, I, I had not been a Christian very long. Uh, I'd given my life to Christ just a couple of years prior. Um, very, uh, I just accepted everything by faith. Okay, I don't really know how to explain this, but I'm just going to believe it by faith. That's how my salvation came. That's how all of our salvations come, by faith. And so at this time, I was very full of faith, but also very uninformed about some of the things. If someone would have come up to me and said, hey, I need you to give me a defense for the hope that is in you. I need you to give me an answer. I don't know if I could have done it. Probably wouldn't have done a very good job. What would you say to somebody if they walked up to you as you walked out of this door or walked out of those doors and they just said, hey, I just happen to be walking by. I see you coming out of church. Tell me why you go to church and tell me why you believe what you believe. What would you say? If you're like me, you probably would have said, well, let me go get my pastor. <laughs> you might not because your pastor is a Gator fan and you might not have a lot of faith in me. <laughs> but when he stood on stage and he said that, and then he started laying out some things for me in that moment, just something clicked. And it was in that message, and it was at that evangelism conference, and in that moment that I knew, it was like, okay, God like whispers in the way that God whispers. If you've ever, if you've ever felt or heard, not audibly necessarily, but just the voice of God leading you to do something, in that moment, I knew it. And it was almost one of those moments where it's like God is going, do you see what I did in your heart through that message? If you will follow me, I will use you to do the same. Not as good as he did it probably, but I will use you to instill hope in the hearts of people. And it's not, again, Please don't hear me saying that Billy Stevens is the reason that anybody has hope. It's just that I will use you to preach a gospel that brings hope to people that they can walk in this world and they can have life in this world that is abundant. It's exactly what Jesus gives us. And in that moment, I knew God was asking me to do something. 
And what I hope to do in these remaining moments here together is to give you a very small sample size of the evidence that supports your faith. The Jesus that you say you believe in. How confident are we that the things that are recorded in Scripture are true? And by the way, I don't have enough time to uncover everything. But I want to tell you that there is tons and tons of evidence out there to support what we believe by faith. And I'm going to cover just, I mean, I'm going to scratch the surface today of some of those things. And the reason that I feel led to do this is because of what we're going to look at today in the sixth I am statement of Jesus. If you would look in John chapter 14, we're going to read straight through verses 1 through 7. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. In this moment, Thomas, doubting Thomas, says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, and a life. He said, I am the Now, that's not popular teaching in today's culture, in case you haven't picked up on that. In today's culture, we live in a culture today that has been strongly shaped by what's called postmodernism. Postmodernism began in the 1970s, ran up into the end of the 1990s, which is why the majority of America's population today, uh, the belief system flows out of postmodernism. Well, what is postmodernism and what is it, the beliefs behind it that shape how we think today? Well, the the thing behind postmodernism is that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is relative. Because it's true for you doesn't mean it has to be true for me, right? That's the teaching of the world today. What's true for you is not necessarily true for me. Everyone is entitled to their own version of the truth. Can I point out something that's pretty obvious, I think, for just a second? There are not versions of the truth. There's the truth. You don't, you don't get to say, oh, well, you know, that may be true for you. That may be, look, if I go, look, there are some constants, right, in the world. There are some truths. If, if, um, if we get up on top of this building and say, hey, you know what, we're just going to, seems like fun. I think gravity will work in our favor today. Let's just jump. I mean, you can say, huh, yeah, it probably won't hurt. That's my truth. Go for it, right? Because there is a truth. There is a gravity. It does work. It always works. There are not versions of the truth. And to say that there is no such thing as an absolute truth, the philosophers of the world would say, can that be absolutely true? There's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, then that's a self-defeating statement. Because for that to be true, there would have to be absolute truth. Y'all get what I'm saying? Again, people say what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. Everyone's entitled to their own version of the truth. That's that's craziness. So postmodernists would say that Jesus then is just one of several ways to a God that everybody's searching for. Jesus is just one of the ways. I mean, listen, every, all the other religions, we're just going to lump you right in there with uh, Jesus' followers. We're just going to lump you right in there with all the other world religions. And you're just one of several ways to reach the same God. As a matter of fact, there was during a, during a debate, there was a postmodern professor debating a Christian apologist. And during that debate, the postmodern thinker said to the apologist the Christian apologist he said don't you see he said all world religions are just the same it's like several blindfolded people 
observing an elephant. You've probably heard the illustration before. One person, blindfolded, is put into this proximity of an elephant, and with his blindfold on, he goes and he feels, and he feels the side of the elephant, and then he's asked to make a declaration about what it is that he is observing. And he says, oh, that's a, that's a wall. He says, okay. And then another, uh, this again is the, the postmodernist explaining how he thinks Christians are lumped into this whole thing. And he says, listen, he says uh, another blindfolded man goes into uh, this same space and he feels the trunk and he says it's a snake. And then a third blindfolded man, he goes in and he feels his tail and he says, no, it's a rope. And then another blindfolded man, he goes in and he grabs his leg and he says, no, no, you're all wrong, it's a tree. And then another blindfolded man goes in and he feels the tusk of the elephant. He says, no, it's a spear. And then another blind man goes in and he feels his ear and he says, no, you're all wrong, it's a fan. And so the postmodern thinker says to the Christian apology, he says, don't you see all religions, they're all just the same in that they are accurately describing their personal experience and the spiritual reality that they have encountered in life. And he says, that the, the whole idea is that given various historical and cultural backgrounds, what, what we're all doing is we're worshiping the same God, we're just calling it something different. To which the, the Christian apologist just absolutely destroys the guy. He says, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. He says, you're missing the most important part. It's not a tree, it's not a spear, it's not a rope, it's not a fan, it's not a wall. It's an elephant. And he said, you're, you're missing the whole big picture. The big picture is that every one of them have got it wrong. And he says, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying, I'm not a rope, I'm not a tree, I'm not a fan, I'm not a wall. He's saying, I'm not a way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He is very exclusive in the way he presents this, and he says, you're not getting to the Father any other way. And here we are in the postmodern world with postmodern thinking, and we're trying to figure out how to present the gospel to people who've grown up with this kind of thinking, and, and a lot of people, unfortunately, and this is why the presentation of the gospel is so important. This is why the church is so important. And not that we keep our faith in here, not that we keep our understanding of Jesus in here and our interactions with Jesus in here, but that we legitimately are taking the gospel out into the world, proclaiming our faith, giving, being ready to give a reason for the hope that is in, in us, being able to do that and willing to do that to people that we go to school with and that we go to work with. And the reason is, is that there's a lot of people out there going, look, there's just a lot of different ways to God and I'm just gonna find a different one because I don't think I really wanna be a part of the church. Which that's an indictment on the church. That's a whole nother sermon for another day. But Jesus, when Thomas says, okay, you said you're going, but we don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here's a question. How can we as Christians, with all this postmodern mindset, how can we as followers of Jesus have confidence that what we believe is the truth? Because, I mean, Muslims seem to be pretty confident in what they believe. I mean, they blow themselves up for it. If it, listen, and... Muslims are willing to strap a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up or fly a plane into a building for the sake of what they believe. <laughs> the irony of it is that, have you ever noticed, I mean, we all do this, right? Like, we all do this. We're all lumped into this thing together. But, man, if it's raining outside on Sunday, man, I don't know if I can go to church today. It's raining. I ought to stay home. Then the next Sunday, the sun's out. It's beautiful. It is too pretty of a day to be inside of a building. I think I should go get in my boat. Right? I mean, we do that. How much, are we, how much are we willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel? And to that extent, like, we, we talk ourselves sometimes out of sharing our faith in public. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. I would rather them be offended now than be offended standing before the judgment seat and them going, hey, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And then we're standing on the other side going, man, I should have told him, right? 
Like I would rather offend them now because I love them. I, you, you can't, if, listen, if, if you love somebody, how much, let me, let me flip that. How much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them about Jesus so that they would die and go to hell separated eternally from God? But here's the question for us. Let me quickly wrap this up. How can we, I just want to give you a handful of things to answer the question, how can we have more confidence that what we believe is true? It's important to understand the lines of debate. Almost everyone believes that a good man named Jesus lived. Almost no one denies that. The only people that deny that are people who just want to deny it because they don't want to have to be accountable to answering the question, who is Jesus? I mean, you, can go look at, you can go look at first century historical documentation written outside of the Bible and you can see that they're not leaving. They're just coming around because they're going to sing. Like... <laughs> No, they're going to preach the gospel right now. That's where they're going. They're going to go lead some people to the Lord right now while I'm preaching. Hey. It's like mass exodus. They're all leaving. All right. There, there are way too many first century documents to point to the reality that there was a man named Jesus who was from Nazareth who lived and existed outside of the Bible. The debate is not centered on his existence. The debate now is centered on his authority. Did Jesus have the authority to say, I'm the only way? That I'm the way, the truth, and the life? Did Jesus have the kind of authority to call himself the Son of God and unapologetically not back down from it? Do we have any evidence that would support any of those things at all? The previous I am statements that we have read in this series have only ramped up to this one where he claims to be the way, the truth, and the life the only way, the only truth, and the only life. This statement shouts exclusivity and it, leads, it leaves no room for debate. So how can we be certain that Jesus is speaking the truth? First, if, you, if you're a note taker, you may want to jot some of these down. First, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament prophecies. Statistics state that there is a one in 100 million billion that is uh, 17 zeros, if you're wanting to draw that out on paper. That there is a one in 100 million billion chance to even fulfill eight of the prophecies from the Old Testament. That if a man said, you know what, because there's a lot of people that go, well, what if Jesus just woke up one day, you know, and said, you know what, I think I want to go fulfill all the prophecies. And just went about walking his life, living his life, trying to fulfill all of them. One in 100 million billion chance to fulfill even eight and there were three over 300 prophecies in the old testament the i am statements i mean of, of the gospel of john are also the fulfillment of old testament prophecies jesus is claiming to be who the prophet said he would be now if you want a mental picture like i can't wrap my head around 17 zeros here is what one person came up with, this would be how you could figure out the statistical possibilities of one man saying, I want to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies and even getting eight of them, okay? Not the 300 plus, just eight of them. Imagine filling the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars, blindfolding a man, letting him walk to wherever he wanted to in the state of Texas, marking one of those silver dollars and coming out, and then going back in and finding it. That's the possibility, that's the statistical possibility of one man fulfilling eight biblical prophecies, and Jesus fulfilled over 300 of them, and there is no denying that he did so. Second, so first one is, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. Second, Jesus claimed to be God in at least three ways. Number one, in John 14, 7, we see that Jesus said that the Father, that Jesus and the Father are one. He said, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This claim bellows Jesus' authority as God, if you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. In John chapter 10, verses 30 and 31, these are not on the screen, but I just want to share them with you. John 10, 30 through 31. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They would not have done that if Jesus claimed to be God was not blasphemous. Number two, 
This is the second claim that Jesus made to be God. Number two, Jesus also declared that he is eternal and predates Abraham, the father of Judaism, which is what the Old Testament teaches. It's where the whole nation of Israel came out of. As expected, this doesn't sit well with his listeners, but I want to read to you what Jesus said in in, um, John chapter 8, 57 through 59. He said, you are not yet 50 years old. The Jews said to him, as you have seen, and you have seen Abraham. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Christ was born, but he was never created. Christ was born, but he was never created, and it is mind-blowing, but it is yet all at the same time true. He is eternal, and he is unchanging. Number three, the third thing, uh, third claim of Jesus, uh, third way that Jesus claimed to be God is uh, further showing Jesus believed that he was equal to the Father. He received worship from his followers. How many of y'all walk around worshiping somebody? Like none, right? I mean, we don't walk around just worshiping people. And here's the interesting thing. It would, have been, it would have been extremely, like if it's weird today, it would have been extremely strange and even sacrilegious back then to call someone God. Paul, Barnabas, and Peter, all New Testament characters that we see, they all told people, do not, do not worship me. They refused when worship was given them in Acts 14 and Acts 10, but Jesus received people's adoration in Matthew 14, 32 and 33, um, when, when Christ and Peter stepped back into the boat uh, and the wind ceased, listen to the response of Peter. It's, it says, uh, those who were, this is in Luke 24, 52, those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. And also directly following the ascension to heaven, the gospel uh, of uh, uh, and Luke's gospel tells this, then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. That was uh, Luke 24. The first one was in Matthew 14. Jesus is not just a human teacher. Jesus, because of his claims. So Jesus claimed to be God. And here's a lot of people, a lot of people in our culture today will go, oh, well, you know, I mean, again, he's, he's just one of the many ways. And they would say, and I won't deny the fact that he was a good teacher. Jesus cannot be a good teacher and call himself God. I mean, if you had a really good professor in college or if you had a really good teacher in high school and you said, man, they were so good, but yet they stood up there and claimed to be God before you every day in your class, you probably wouldn't say, man, they were just such a good teacher. You would say, they are crazy. And so the only possibility is, as one person famously said, is Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or the third option is he's Lord. And there is so much evidence that points to the fact, and I'm telling you, if you really want to take your your brain for a spin, buy a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Your head will hurt, but you will walk away from it just so encouraged in your heart by all the evidence that supports the very thing that we say we believe by faith, which is the point of the book. If evidence and faith are inversely proportional, then you got to have a ton of evidence, or you gotta have, you gotta have a ton of faith if you don't have any evidence. But what he's saying is, listen, with all of the evidence out there, you don't have to have a lot of faith because there's just a ton of evidence. And he said, so I don't have enough faith though to be an atheist because there's just not a lot of information to support the background. I mean, think about it. How many times do our young people, we were probably taught the same thing. Hey, um, we're all the result of a big bang. Great. I mean, I believe that too, right? We all know this. God said, bang, and there it is. But they say, like the people in this world will say, I can't believe anything that I can't see. You can't see electricity either. I don't believe in anything that I can't measure. Well, here is the problem. Everything. So you're gonna say, Oh, you're just a faith-based person. I can't, you know, I can't reason with you. Well, you're a faith-based person too if you believe in the Big Bang. How did the Big Bang start? There were gases, there was energy, came together, boom. Where'd the gases and the energy come from? So you believe by faith gas, I'm gonna believe by faith God. After Christ's resurrection, hey, you want more proof and then we'll close with this. Finally, the, The empty tomb is the staggering proof of Christ's 
claimed to be God. Three days after Christ's crucifixion, the disciples found an empty tomb. We celebrate that every year on Easter. And just as Jesus had forewarned them, I I mean, we all, like, I don't know about you, but I question, like, he said he was going to rise on the third day. Where were you guys at? I got to have been out there with a bucket of popcorn, man. Come on. Let's see it. Here's the interesting thing. The, he, because Jesus had said on numerous occasions that he would be raised from the dead, the authorities were desperate. They were desperate. Roman authorities were desperate to prove that the resurrection was impossible and went to great lengths to prevent the body from being stolen. So they rolled a heavy tomb over the front of the entrance, or the or a big stone over the front of the entrance of the tomb, big, huge stone, impossible for one man to move. Then they placed guards out in front. But in the midst of it all, Jesus was gone. The grave was empty. No one has ever, 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 ever found the body of Jesus. So a man that for sure existed by history's sake, and a man that no one has been ever able, been able to find, It's because he wasn't there. Now listen, people did see him alive. So after he was dead, after he was verified dead, after he was put in a tomb, three days later, he raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. And the turning point of our faith is not the crucifixion, but the resurrection. And so it's because of the resurrection, we know that God, Jesus is God. Jesus is who he said he was. And by the way, he appears to more than 500 people after the resurrection. By the way, like people can hallucinate, right? I mean, people can have some really crazy, like I saw a ghost. No, you did not. Casper, maybe. Some of y'all may see ghosts tonight. I mean, there should be some floating around, running around in costumes, right? But like, there's no such thing as a group hallucination. 500 people affirming the same thing. We saw Jesus He was alive, he was raised from the dead, and more than any other statement that Jesus makes of the I am statements, John 14, 6, stops us in our tracks. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And in the original New Testament language, the language that is Greek, this statement has more going on than it has in the English. The countless times uh, that, that I've just heard this verse and read this verse, I thought it was just kind of a, I am the way, A, I am B, I am the truth, C, I am the life. It was kind of a listing. However, in the Greek's language, the richness of it is shown through the cyclical statement in which the previous word is the foundation of the next. I am the way because I am the truth and the life. The the structure of the statement is such that Jesus was not giving a string of descriptive terms he was saying. I am the way, it's called elliptical form. Don't get the images of the thing that you have that you hang your clothes on in your bedroom, okay? This is elliptical form in literacy, and it says, so here's what Jesus is saying, I am the way because I am the truth and because I am the life, and it is, he is saying, I am the way to the Father because I am the true manifestation of the revelation of the Father, and I am the way to the Father because I alone have the power to eternal life. That is what Jesus is saying. And so we can go about trying to fulfill our life in other ways, but you will never find life apart from Jesus. He is not a way. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the way because he is the truth, because he is the life, and you will only find it in him. So if you're here today and you're trying to find your life in other things, you will never, ever, ever find it. You first have to give your life to Christ, submit your life to Christ, which is, I I love when Anita asked him, those girls that were getting baptized, are you ready now to give your life to following Jesus? Yes. It's not about just believing in something. It's like, hey, I'm I'm not just going to intellectually believe But now, because of the facts, because of what God has done, because how God has saved me and because how God has spoken to me so clearly, I am now going to give my life to follow the way, the truth, and the life. 